Family Theater presents J. Carol Nash and Diana Lynn. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, brings you The Pardoner's Tale, written by Jeffrey Chaucer and starring J. Carol Nash. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Diana Lynn. Thank you, Jean. Geoffrey Chaucer, probably the first of the great English storytellers, was born some 600 years ago of a family high among those employed in the service of the king. But it was as a poet that he left his mark in the world, the beautiful poetry to be found in the Canterbury Tales. Written in an English that would hardly be understood today, these stories not only reveal the times in which Chaucer lived, but also his talent for telling stories, a talent that in my estimation is still unsurpassed. So now it is with real pleasure that I give you the setting for The Pardoner's Tale, with J. Carol Nash as The Pardoner. It is April in the year 1387, and the England of only two and one-half million inhabitants is emerging once more from the dark imprisonment of the long winter months. Consequently, the order of the day is travel, and the objective for many is the shrine of the English martyr, Thomas a. Beckett at Canterbury. A group of 29 such pilgrims have come up in the early afternoon to Suffolk, and are gathered in the Talbot Inn where they plan to spend the night and set out early in the morning for Canterbury. The owner of the Talbot Inn is one Harry Bailey, a red-faced, energetic man who is determined that his guests shall enjoy their stay. In addition to unveiling his treasures from kitchen and keg, Harry has offered his personal talents as master of the ceremonies in the great hall of the inn. He has so far been successful in persuading some of the guests to tell stories, with the result that they have heard from a battered old knight, a merchant, a lawyer, a yeoman, and now a Franklin has just finished his story, and it behooves Harry to see that the enjoyment does not slack. All right, all right. Peace, lads and lassies. Oh, excuse me, my tongue twisted on me. Peace, ladies and gentlemen, peace. Or oh, the morrow will be here before we can hear from everyone gathered on this happy occasion. Now you've just heard a fine tale from the Franklin about the poor, unfortunate Aurelius. And it would not be improper for you to take it to heart. Do that, and you will have moral profit for having spent an evening at old Harry Bailey's. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know that some of you are saying that old Harry will have profit of another sort, and you be right. <laughs> But now we've got to get on, as they say, and it's come to my attention from yon handsome squire that we've heard no story from the bashful pardoner. Come, come, pardoner, you have been full well entertained yourself now, and it's only fair that you do your bit. All right, all right. Now, it's not necessary for you to carry on so. I'm quite capable of, of making my own way. <laughs> Young Harry Bailey uses a word never before applied to myself when he says that I am about to entertain ye. If I should bring about some entertainment here this evening, then it would surprise nobody so much as myself. <laughs> I cannot help it if I find that my most natural inclinations steer me a course in which I find little of worldly entertainment value but everything that is a real lasting value. Come now, pardoner. You'd just be wasting time getting into your story. There are many to be heard from, and we want to hear a story. <laughs> well, all, all right. Now, the, uh, the impatient lady herself is prologue enough for the story I have to tell. I must ask that you listen closely as I talk, and as you hear me, you must bring about within yourselves a suspension of disbelief which will be natural to you when you hear the type of men I propose to tell about. Thus, I ask that you believe me when I say that the principles of my tale, John, William, and Nicholas, have never heard of death. These three men were much given to the pursuit of the spirits that come in liquid form. You all know the type I mean. 
They did not gather as you have here in a friendly attitude, but rather they would come together for the purpose of achieving a drunken state wherein they would follow their inclinations into all sorts of deviltry. Well, there came a day when the three roisterers found themselves in a tavern in a town far from their home. Barmaid! Barmaid! Where is a sleeping little baggage? Expects a man to perish in his thirst, does she? Well, let her wake to this. Hey, John, you would not pretend that a small ale girl can make you draw your blade in anger. Put it away, John. Well, then I shall lay it close by. In readiness, lest the young idler come with a lame excuse for tormenting three of her father's best patrons. Ah, uh, Nicholas, you said not a word beyond your greeting this night. Surely you wouldn't keep secrets in such a place as this. Hmm? John... I had a dream when last I slept, the likes of which has pursued me to this moment. <laughs> a dream? Why, that's not to be serious about. Let, you, let me tell you, my boy, that dreams are what I live in. Uh, and when you have lived the 20 more years I have on you, then you also will live in your dreams. Now, come, let us drink, Nicholas. Barmaid, bring on the dreams. John, please, <laughs> b before you get so you cannot hear me, let me tell you that which came to me in my terrible sleep. Uh, I hear you, Nicholas, and I promise to give you the best of my attention. A teller. Nicholas, you tell not a whit till you put up the money for the aid I see Betty drawing. Aye. Oh, We're about to drink the last of it, then. Here. Now, have you memory of the old man called Gaspardo? That I have. Yes? Well, in my dream, I saw a black-robed figure who called himself Death come upon old man Gaspardo as he lay flat on his bench, all drunken, and he smote the old man and stole away, leaving him lying in unending agony. Uh, uh, Later, <laughs> I saw the same black robe thief, and he swooped down on a village and went away, leaving a thousand writhing victims of his clout, <laughs> and he called himself Death. Oh, you must learn, Nicholas, that it is that which you can see that you must fear, nothing else. This being called Death in your dream doesn't exist. Mm, ah! Here's Betty with her wares. Give me your drinks, gentlemen. Huh, by the sound of it, the girl must have bells on her toes. The uh, better to keep you awake, Betty. Hmm? The bell you hear comes not from my feet. Tis a body passing by in the street. The money's correct. Call me when you want more. No, stay, Betty. You make mention of a body passing on the outside. Uh, what are you speaking? You may have known the old man who they be taken to his grave. It is old man Gaspardo. He got took by death in the night. Death? Watch how you talk, lass. She's only making fun, John. Tell us, Betty, for what reason is a body going to a grave? To stay there. That be for what? Uh, well, what does the ringing of the church bell mean? It be the first of the tolling for the thousand of both man and woman, child, hind and page, that death has took in the pestilence in Virk village. Death is loose nearby. I told you, John. I'd be your tongue gotten loose, Nicholas. Let me question the girl. Uh, who, who is this death being, Betty? Death. Tell us all you know about him. Death is a thief that comes in darkness upon man and clove his heart into and she, steal away. She describes him, John. Then Nicholas here had no dream. By this sword on the table, I say that death is on the march and must be stopped. What say you two that we stop him ourselves, hmm? My sword lies with yours, John. And mine. Ah. Then the two of you must know that there is no turning back. Death is a being that would take us out of the pleasure of this world if we but give him a chance. So drink you now with me a covenant that will join us three inseparably. Pick up each your sword, gentlemen, and we will search out this villain, Death. We arrive first to yon church where death's bell yet rings. Now, if you have listened well, you know that John, William, and Nicholas are truly like no one that we know in our lives. But for the sake of the story, it is necessary for you to believe that such men exist. And so it was that the three men sped along the road to the Virk village. They traveled much as we are inclined to travel through our lives, with racing hearts and blinded reason. Well, it was but a short time that they spied a dark, robed figure coming toward them. Uh, I see him. I see him. Look over there. 
Where is the cullion, William? See, coming across the young track. Ah. The monster is wrapped all in black, like in a dream. Yeah, I see him sneaking out of the village, you'll note. Mark him well. Come, follow me. Oh, death! We have found you, and you will not get away from we who have pledged your end. Death, is it that she called me? Well, no wonder. These tattered black rags which serve to hold my body to my spirit would make a fair maiden look like death from yon extremity. Hail, Lord! May God see you and keep you on this day. This is he whom I saw in my dreams, John. I grant that he looks like nothing that lives. Speak, old man. Why walk you wrapped so in the black robe of death if you be not death? Speak, for I split you in half. Please, no. I am only an old man who walks in a search over the world for a young man who will engage to give his youth in barter for my age. <laughs> what fool would trade for the wraith you have to offer? No wraith, Lord. In return for youth, I offer the wisdom of more than 80 years of travel across the world. Death himself is what you are. No! Please let me go on my wretched way. I'm not that for which you search. I demand that you prove that you are not death. If I were him whom you call death, would I hesitate to take action against you three who have threatened me? Hmm. Old man, having traversed the earth as you claim, possibly you can tell us thereby where death can be found this moment. You have but to ask me. You see yon grove of trees, this side of the village? Aye, they are quite visible. Were you to go to the mightiest tree of all in the grove, under it you will find what you seek. And may the blessings of the Lord be upon you, all three. And so John, William and Nicholas took the advice of the old man they met on the road. They drove their horses down the path at breakneck speed and soon drew abreast of the mighty tree he had mentioned. Be wary now, lads. Let's draw our swords, for if the old man was a spy of death, then this may well be a trick. I've never seen such a big tree. Almost anything could hide in it or behind it. Yeah, the big tree has been generous to the grasses about it. I feel that the old man must truly have known that this was a hiding place for... The... Oh, ho! Hey, lads, what can this be before me, huh? What is it, John? You can see that it be a big chest of some sort. Then the old man did trick us. I should have split him when I started to. Do you plan to open it, John? Possibly you should not. It would be folly for us not to look inside. Here, here, one of you put your blades, as I do mine, and then we'll try to pry the top up. Here. I, if, careful, does it. Uh, coming loose. We'll soon uh, have it. <laughs> there. Look! The chest is full of gold. Gold's not in. Look, John. Aye, I see the gold. A king's ransom here, lads, and it's all ours. I cannot believe that such a collection of money exists. At least that we can keep it. No, oh, William, you speak like a horse. Why should we not be able to keep the florins? We have found them ourselves, and we three have an agreement bringing equal share to each of us. Well, that is a large chest, John. How shall we take it with us? Well, first we must scan about and see that no one has seen us as we came upon this fortune. As to moving it, <laughs> that'll be easy enough. We must wait till dark, else we shall be robbed carrying this much gold on us. Will you hold your dribbling tongue and listen to me? One of us must travel back to the village and bring us large bags in which to carry away each our share. We need bread and wine also, for it is fitting that we celebrate our good fortune. <laughs> but who must go, John? John's horse is the biggest and fastest. Possibly... Listen to me, lads. We shall draw lots, huh? and the loser will have to go, and the other two will stay here and guard the money till his return. That should be fair enough. Yeah, here are three twigs. I'd break them. So, and arrange them in my hand so that each appears to be just as long as the others. I see. Each shall draw, and the one who is the possessor of the shortest of the three must ride to the village. One of you must draw first. I will. And I shall take this one. And I this. Oh, it leaves me with the longest one. And gives me the shortest. Oh, you'd best get to horse, Nicholas. As we've gone long without wine, it'll be good to toast our fortune and then divide the coin. John, we are well hid by the brush here about. Possibly you and I should start counting out the money as we wait for Nicholas. Yes, a worthy suggestion, William. Nicholas, have you not gone yet? Why do you linger? You're a rich lad. 
Now, be gone with you. But, but I do not think it necessary that you count the money. Possibly Nicholas has need of money for the wine, John. Hmm? Oh, well, then here. Take some, Nicholas. All right, then. I shall go now, but my horse will travel as never he has before, I assure you. Nicholas soon found himself back in the tavern they had left earlier, and he lost no time in demanding that the ale girl find three bottles of the best wine for him. After a look at the gold coin, she scurried off to the wine cellar, and Nicholas seated himself at a small table where he rested his weary head in his arms and pursued happy thoughts of what he soon would do with all his money. I will taste the first of my many pleasures soon to come my way, with all my newfound wealth. They said they would divide the money while I was gone. I wonder how much I shall get. But why divide it? What was that? I said, why divide it at all? I fail to understand from whence comes this voice. Nicholas, you cannot fool me. I am your conscience, and I know you better than you yourself. You want all the money for yourself. Yes, I, I do. And if I divide it... Yes, you are beginning to understand. You are only one person, and one portion is a lot more than one third, if you get even that. Huh? Uh, what do you mean, if I get even that? Oh, uh, they're waiting for me and are counting out my portion. Oh, are they? Are they counting it out for you, Nicholas? Or are they... Yes, or are they counting it only two ways? But we pledged each other. <laughs> you pledged each other. <laughs> Perhaps they have forgotten the pledge. Uh, oh, I must have drowsed. I've had too much to drink this day. Uh, where is that girl with the wine? Here you are, sir. Give me those. I told you I was in a hurry. Uh, where is the nearest apothecary shop? Two streets over. His name is Billingsgate. Here is money for you. Now get out of the way. But, sir, your gold coin, it is, it is too much for the wine. So John and William think they're going to divide the money, do they? Well, maybe I shall have something to say about that. <laughs> You are Billingsgate, the apothecary? Yes, good afternoon, sir. Uh, perhaps you wish some little pills for your stomach? No, I want no little pills. I Maybe want... some lavender scents for your lady love? No, I want some rat poison. For your rats? Yes? Well, you may not have noticed the fine writing paper imported from Cathay and the India. The only thing I ask of you is that you sell me some rat poison. Importations are not as expensive as you think, sir. Look, I'm in a hurry. My house is infested with many rats. Very well. Very well. Very well. Now, let me see. Where is that rat poison? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, you say you have many rats? Then this should not be too much. This will be just right. Here is your money. Oh, my. You're infested with gold. But, sir... Oh, my, so much gold and he buys only rat poison. Oh, my. And now the last of the coins. One for there, there... And there. See, John, three large piles of beautiful gold florins. I see them, William. And now that you have so much money, what do you plan to do with it all? <laughs> I shall have no trouble dispensing with my wealth. First, I shall buy the finest horse in the land. Mm -hmm. And then what? Then I shall provide him with gold saddle and bridle. And then? Then I will ride him out and command to be built a fine palace where I will reign like a king. <laughs> Yours is a foolish plan, William. Sir? It'll be only a short time before you have no more gold florin. You have a better plan? Aye, that I do. Then tell it to me. Well, you can be certain that I will do nothing that will provide me with no increase of my wealth. How will you do it? I shall mount my horse and then ride to the sea. To the sea? Aye, have you not heard of the tremendous amount of goods that are being transported over water from Cathay and India? I have, but what, what has it to do with you? I shall take my gold and buy a large ship and fit it with the best of all that a ship demands. And become a transporter of goods from far lands, <laughs> eh? Better than that. 
I shall be master of a ship that intercepts those that transport. Aye, I'm beginning to see. You will get all the goods after all and sell them at your own prices. <laughs> that I will. And it will be this very gold you see before us that will bring it all about. And shortly mine shall be all gone. William, hmm? you would be willing to come by more money, would you not? You know that I would. We should have made only two piles of coins. Two p- we must contend with Nicholas very soon. Which will be easy enough. I shall kill him with my knife. Which will not be easy, John. You know that Nicholas is bigger and stronger than you. You will not have an easy time against him. His very strength shall bring about his fall. What do you mean by that? Well, you know how Nicholas shows off his strength by wrestling. I do that. He has thrown me many the time. Then when he returns, you must get him to wrestle with you. But you know I cannot overcome him in wrestling. I know. But as you two thrash about on the ground, I will watch for a chance to give him the knife. Is it agreed? Agreed. William, before this day is out, you and I shall have all the money. Whoa! 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 Nicholas, we have waited long for you and are thirsty for the wine. Come, honey. Oh, you took a long time, Nicholas, did you? Carry to spend all the money you had? I came as fast as I could. And quickly, quickly with the wine. I have it here in one of the sacks, as safe as you please. Here's the first one, William. Take it. I will that. Ah, uh, it is still cool from the wine cellar. Here, John, you may have it. Yeah, I'm glad I am to get it. Here is another. Oh. You are oh. clumsy. Don't, Nicholas, dropping mine. I thought you had a hole on the bottle. With, why, my hand was not near the bottle. Do you accuse me of lying? I shall show you... Draw your blade, Nicholas. Well, why do you act this way, William? You may have the other bottle. I said draw, Nicholas. Hey, caution, William, Nicholas. If you two must engage, then it shall be only till one loses his blade. I have no desire to draw with you, William, but you have forced me to it. You have been a fool to engage me because you know I am better with a sword than you. He shall see who has been the fool, Nicholas. Now you are beginning to see. If it be till one lose his blade, then this shall be it. Uh. You acted in time, John. I believe he would have forced my sword had he completed his last lunge. We must waste no time now, William. There's much to be done. I feel a great thirst. Before we do anything else, I must drink my wine. Uh Oh, then we shall both drink and then divide the coins and get the other bottle from the sack. Aye. (laughs) <laughs> Did you not think I was clever in accusing Nicholas of dropping the bottle purposely? <laughs> Where is the other? Oh, oh, here. Here it is. <clears throat> I'll drink a toast with you, William. A toast that yon gold florins last you forever in your ambitious plan. <laughs> <laughs> and to you also a toast, John. May you have many successful boardings at sea. <clears throat> <clears throat> It is full of... William! He tricked us! Poison! He has poison! Oh, Nicholas wanted all the gold. Allow none of us. I shall have it. And so, now ye have heard how it was that three rogues traveled down the road to death and destruction, while yet they intended something just the opposite. Which brings me to the moral of my story. A well-told story it was, and we all thank ye, pardoner, and wish ye well on your trip to Canterbury. Harry Bailey, ye will not be rushing an old pardoner away until he have made his point. Ye should be ashamed of yourself. Ye have taken my entertainment, and now ye will allow young travellers to hear me out. Aye, pardoner, ye will proceed. Before I take me tired old bones off to a bit of rest... I want you all to be aware of the position you enjoy in this world. Think well 
and the advantage you have of knowing that death awaits ye all. Well, Harry, I, I, I wish now that you'd have my bed prepared for me, for I'm tired and uh, I have a very long road to travel again in the morning. With a mind, boy, I J. Carol Nash for a really fine performance as the Pardoner. You know, of all the Canterbury tales, the Pardoner's tale carries the grimmest and most fearful moral. It's a little parable of human selfishness. And it quite simply tells us that selfishness can never breed anything but distrust, hate, and unhappiness. Selfishness, selfishness will do the same thing then in a marriage. It will kill love and ruin every chance for family happiness and permanency. I don't think it's at all far-fetched to compare a successful marriage with the successful climbing of a steep and dangerous mountain. Two people climb together, work together, think together, in fact, are actually tied together in such a way that disaster for one means disaster for both. Unselfishness is forced upon them by the very nature of the job they're trying to do. Of course, it isn't easy to forget oneself and think first of another, even if that other is one you have vowed to love and to help. But one sure way of achieving it is by asking God to help make you a better helpmate. Yes, prayer. Daily family prayer will help make, make your marriage the lasting, loving partnership it should be. For the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Family Theater has brought you J. Carol Nash and Jeffrey Chaucer's classic The Pardoner's Tale with Diana Lynn as your hostess. This adaptation from the Canterbury Tales was written by Hanley Goodrich with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. In our cast were Tudor Owen, Ben Wright, Jay Novello, Jeff Corey, Virginia Gregg, Eric Snowden, and Robert North. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program and by the mutual network which has responded to this need. This is Gene Baker inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when your family theater will bring you Celeste Home to introduce Dane Clark and Henry Hull in Herman Melville's great classic of the sea, Moby Dick. Join us, won't you? This program came from Hollywood. For a daytime drama of family life, hear the romantic against the storm, carried over the mutual line, and most likely heard over the station to which you are now listening. This is the Mutual Broadcasting...